This week's episode is brought to you in part by Empix, delivering the highest quality prints and products from your photos. Shoot today, upload tonight, we ship tomorrow. On this week's episode, I've got a quick tip using Refine Edge to do some retouching. And I have a technique to make seamless patterns. And I'm going to show you how to use the path tool to create some great backgrounds and elements. And it all starts right now. Welcome to Photoshop User TV, brought to you by the National Association of Photoshop Professionals. And now, here are your hosts, the Photoshop Guys. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another ultimate episode of Photoshop User TV. So last week was, last week was an ultimate, ultimate <laughs> so anyway. Welcome. We have, we have arrived at the ultimate, yes. <laughs> Photoshop News TV brought to you by the National Association of Photoshop Professionals, publishers of, of course, Photoshop User Magazine, right here, hold by, held by Corey in different it's, ways. Corey's it's in 3D. Getting a whole new spin on the magazine holding. I rotate it in 3D space. <laughs> okay. So we're here, myself, Dave Cross, Corey Barker, and over there, Pete Collins, here to share with you some mm. Photoshop goodness. Goodness. Of various yeah. kinds. Uh, one thing we should mention before we get started is uh, Photoshop World is coming up not too far away in March in Washington, D.C. Spectacular. Registration is open, so you should go and check it out. Some amazing classes going on, some new instructors, some of your old favorites, so come and join us all in D.C. Always a great time. DC. I still, I'm, I'm, I'm not even tired of it. I don't know how many times I've been, I still don't get tired of it. This will be my a, Don't we have early bird registration? Yeah, early bird right goes on for a while, so you can save yourself some money. There's always some kind of deal going on, and... This will be my 22nd Photoshop world, and it's still just as much fun as the very first one. And I'm one. very psyched we're doing DC. Right? Yeah, Never have done DC be cool. before. It's very, very cool. exciting. So should be fun, so make sure you join us there. And uh, you can find out about that at uh, photoshopworld.com, of course. Tell them we sent you, and they'll do nothing for you, but it'll make us feel good. They'll so. smile when you... <laughs> so <laughs> Corey's going to kick us off with a quick tip. I have a very quick tip. Actually, it's a using Refine Edge. Um, once you start experimenting, understand how Refine Edge really works, you can do a lot of interesting things with it. In, um, in this case, I've got this um, very lovely picture of a tree. It's a tree. It's a very serene, mm -hmm. lovely. You just want to stare at it. <laughs> but we can't. So I didn't actually take this, uh, but you may encounter a scenario where you may have taken a nature or landscape shot like this, and you think, well, it's great, but it's not awesome. And the reason in this case is this huge gap at the top of the tree. See that? I mean, mm. It just didn't fill in right and everything like that. So there's obviously some fixing that needs to be done to make this tree awesome. So we're going to use Refine Edge. But first, I'm going to go and grab the lasso tool and just go over here to a part of the tree that I know is nice and full. I'm just going to draw a very loose selection. And no, I did not fill that in before. OK, no, I just I couldn't see where your mouse was. Oh, OK, no, I got you. So just, well, um, just a random area of the tree. So with that selection active, I'm just going to go up here in the Options bar and click on Refine Edge. And you can see it isolates it down. I've got it in viewing on, against transparency right now, which is fine. But I'm going to go over here into the edge detection and actually just increase the radius uh, somewhat. And I'm not going to use smart radius because I've discovered if you turn it on, it's bringing back a little bit more of that sky and so that background area I don't really want. So this is one of the few instances when the smart radius isn't going to help me in this case. So it's always a good idea to toggle it on and off, see how it helps you or doesn't help you. You may be working against the, uh, the flow if you do that. So with that, I'm going to go over here and think the selection looks pretty good. So I'm just going to um, hit OK and make it, bring it back as an active selection. But now the selection is modified more to the edge, the contrasting edge of that uh, graphic. So I'm just going to press Command-J, puts that selected area on a new layer. So now it's a nicely extracted section of the tree. So I can just move that right over here, maybe give it a little bit of rotation here. And because it's got nicely extracted from that background, it's getting, getting the same light on that side of the tree, it actually blends in fairly seamlessly. So you can almost not even tell mm -hmm. where it was discovered. So it's using Refine Edge in a way that you may not have necessarily thought of, but is just as effective because it uses the same technology. So you can just go around here and just patch in other parts of the tree. If I do another small area here, I can go, yay. Oh, I'm not on the right layer. <laughs> Somebody should get a prize if they caught that. Oh, too much. So once again, just put that on a new layer. I can fill in this little bit of a gap here. And I can just go around, patch it, make it a nice, pretty tree. And it's all pretty seamless because it takes advantage of that 
really impressive uh, refined edge, which I love. I can't, I yeah. can't imagine uh, not using it. It really is true, and I think you hit the nail on the head too, where because a lot of people ask about that smart radius on or off, and mm -hmm. the answer is it depends. Yes, sometimes exactly. it works like a charm, other times you just have to try it, mm -hmm. see what it does. Precisely, it, it yeah. will vary. I love it. Very cool. Okay, and now Pete has something for us. It says quick toot. So it's a tutorial, toot. not a tip. Well, that's good. We need to clarify that. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, if some of y'all saw on last week's uh, photoshopuser.com website, I talked about using the path tool to create random background. It's kind of like a random background generator. And what I was looking for is I wanted to create some drawings, and oftentimes I need to go in and shade things, and I would go in and crosshatch over those areas. Well, I decided I wanted to create a background of crosshatching that I could use over and over again, and I wanted it big enough to be able to cover a two-page spread in case I was ever gonna do a tabloid spread or something. And so what I did is I went in and I took the crosshatching hatching brush, which is right over here, and all it is is when you draw, it creates kind of like three strokes, three strokes, it crosshatches back and forth. Well, if I wanted to create one whole page of that, I could sit here and just crosshatch, I could draw all the way across it. But I decided to do something that I could use over and over again. And it was a little tedious. I created a, I showed my grid. I went to my view and I went to show grid. And you can set up by clicking in there, you can set how many spaces in the grid you want. But I set it up to give me 10 spaces across doesn't really matter, but then I simply started taking, let me get rid of this, I started taking my pen tool and I would put a dot here, bring it over to the edge of the paper, let me hide that, hide that, and I'd click and then I'd come down to one section on the grid, I had snapping turned on so it'd make it easier, and I just went back and forth and literally this is one whole path that snakes back and forth about a hundred times all the way down the page. And you think that's a little crazy, but what it now allows me to do is anything I want to create a background with, any of these brushes, I simply highlight, if I come over here to my pass panel, let's say I highlight that. Now if I go to a new layer and I choose that paintbrush, I can set it for anything I want. If I choose that paintbrush and now I simply right click with my pen tool and I can simply say stroke path. And it's gonna go, you wanna use the brush that you just set all those parameters for? And I say, okay. And it'll just start filling in those brush strokes all the way across. And the nice thing is, is that it's going to allow those things to interact because of the way I've set up the brush presets. It kind of gives it that jitter randomness. And so it just goes back and forth and fills that all in, but it doesn't give you that, that repetitive look, it gives you all this jumbled randomness, which is what you want when you're creating rust, you're creating any kind of texture. You don't want that telltale repeating pattern across it. And so it's really fun to be able to then start playing with brushes and figuring out different things you can use. And the nice thing is that any of these paths, you can copy it, you can make another instance of it. I can drag it down here and say, copy that. And now I can select Command or Control T and I can just squish all those paths down to really intricate, really tight. And it uh, allows me to uh, do a tighter thing. Okay, so anyway, I'm gonna stroke that and it'll give you a different look according to how you squish it together. But what I wanted to show you was that then you can create little things like you can create grass and fuzzy things that are all gonna be random that you couldn't generate by simply trying to draw them out. While I was thinking about that, I thought, hey, instead of just doing something normal like that, what if we do the free transform path tool? Let's say you wanted to use the path tool and create like steam or something. You could start coming in here and drawing free transform, but then you could uh, apply the stroke to those paths to give you a little more definite direction to where you're gonna put something instead of having to go in and try to draw something. No, I don't like that undo, come back and draw it again. So just remember that using the path tool, you can be very creative, but you can also use it to generate things that you couldn't do if you just did it freehand. Kind of random, kind of, once you start to see it, hopefully you'll play with it, you'll get the idea. I've been sitting in my office playing with, well, would it look better with some circles? I've made bubbles, I've made all kinds of things, and it's a great background generator for you to use to create whatever you want. I like the idea, and I think that's, you know, one of the things that, that 
for as long as we've been doing this show, that's a big part of, I think, what we try and do is just throw out the seed of an idea yeah. because, you know, that's just something where people have to try it and, and someone will grasp onto that and go, oh, that's perfect for, you know, this project. Yeah, I've been able to make uh, random... Uh Looks like stone grass is great to create if you need to create a, a grass background mm -hmm. or something like that. It's really helpful to be able to just put sure. it all because we've got the grass brush mm -hmm. already in there, made by Bert Monroy, yeah. and to be able to tweak the presets and it'll just create a, a lovely grass field for you. Very he, cool. He has strayed from the path. <laughs> no, he's on the path too. <laughs> I get off the there. path quite. He's often. on the path of something. Something other. All right. Well, we're going to take a break to ponder what path we're on. And when we come back, I have a tutorial. We've got prizes, all that goodness that we normally do. So come on back, won't you? Well, we are back, and after the pondering we did during that break, Pete has more because he just can't stop. Can't get enough. <laughs> either, either they decided my last one wasn't good enough, or they just can't get enough of me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play like they can't get enough of me. <laughs> Here's a real quick tip. This is well, you just saw me with this on the screen here. Let's say you've created this on this page right here, and then you're wanting to put it into another scene. Now this scene is only about 1,200 pixels where this one is a tabloid size. And what a lot of people would do is when you bring it over, it comes in and it clunks down super huge. Now you can do a couple shortcuts. You can, you can make the whole canvas big enough to, to grab the entire image and then you can shrink it down. But what I prefer to do is simply hit Command or Control T and then go up here and hit this link button right here between the width and the height. And I can simply use my scrubby to pull this in till it gets big enough that I can move it around. And the nice thing is it's now locked in its ratio so I don't have to worry about getting it off size. But I've already got it set to where I want. I don't have to increase or decrease the background, but I simply take that object, plunk it in there, move that scrubby slider over, and I shrink it down till it's a workable size and then place it in there instead of having to try to guess from the, the size this big onto the background this big and try to think how big I want to get it before I have to bring the background back up. And so that little link button up there on the uh, free transform is a great little shortcut. So it is. The universe knows no bounds. Wow. Well, you're very profound after staring at that tree all that time. Aren't you? <laughs> well, I had, a, I had enough time in that last break to think, and I just no. I, actually, it's a no. I don't. <laughs> I just made that up, actually. Anyway, where are we at? Whew. Well, I have a uh, tutorial for you. When you have a photograph or something that has some maybe some texture in it, and you want to make it into repeating patterns, so you can fill in a larger image, but you don't want to see those seams that you would right, see if you yeah. just tried to repeat it. Because of course, in Photoshop, you can take anything and just say define pattern, but then you will see, okay, that's obviously where right, the repetition yeah, so. is. So this has been around for some time, but with the this the most recent version of Photoshop and some of the things like spot here and things like that makes a big difference. So I'm going to take my marquee tool, hold on the shift key so I can make a square. It tends to work better, I think, if you get a square. Now, I've tried to be fairly careful about not making a selection that cut like halfway through a brick, because I mean, you could, but it just tends to, as I play with this more, I found if I got some of the mortar in here, it just kind of tended to work a little better. Now, there's going to be some things cut off on the side, but that's just kind of the way it is. So I'm going to copy that make a new document, and paste it. And this is going to be where my pattern will be created. So now at this point, I'm going to use a filter called Offset. And if I happen to pay attention when it pasted, it seemed to me it was around 900 and something pixels. I didn't really see, but it doesn't mean really matter that much. But as you put the numbers in, you'll see that it kind of moves things around. So what was the side is now in the middle, and what was the other side is in the middle. So mm -hmm. the top, and I'm pointing to my laptop in Matt's uh, method of doing things, <laughs> the top and the bottom are going to match up, and the two sides will match up. So whatever you do, you got to be careful not to touch those. All right. the work you do is in the middle. So 
when I look at it, overall, it, it's not bad. I can see, you know, there's some obvious seams where a brick is changing color and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and two bricks are right up against each other where it needs to have some mortar in between. So the, the so couple of minor things, tweaking, but, yeah. minor tweaking, and, and sometimes you'll be lucky like this, other times you'll need more, but mm -hmm. the concept I'm gonna show you works the same in any case. So what I wanna do, for example, between these two bricks is add some mortar. So I'm gonna look somewhere else, not in the same place, use my clone stamp tool. I've just got it set on normal. I'm gonna option click up here to sample where I wanna go from and then just kind of paint to get a little border between the two. And in some cases, that'll be all that's necessary. Where it gets a little more challenging is, for example, let's zoom in a, a little too far there. At the top here, you can see there's a brick that's now looks like it's two different colors. Well, one of the things I've been trying fairly recently is just going in with the spot healing brush and sometimes just kind of doing random kind of painting like this with, okay, not that one. <laughs> that's the advantage of this uh, tool as you can try, but you just kind of do some little bits of painting and sometimes just by doing that, you're starting already to get something that's looking pretty decent. You know, it's getting mm. the kind of look you want. Down here, my picture's moving here. On this one, let's just see if I do that. Well, that didn't really help. So the other option would be to take the quick selection tool and just kind of select the brick and then use something like levels. What I normally do is this, I go to levels, then I press Command and Control H, so I've hidden the selection, and now I can look at just kind of lightening the brick up so enough so that it kind of starts to match mm -hmm. a little better, and then it's easier to do that kind of cloning yeah. over the top of it. And once you've done that a few times, it's pretty quick to look and see, okay, here's another problem here, so quick selection tool, I would select this half, Command and Control L for levels, Command and Control H for hide, and then just kind of come in. And it in doesn't and, necessarily need to be perfect. No, it doesn't, but it's, at this it's point, be a background and right. you won't see that kind of detail anyway, but yeah. So I won't do the whole thing, but the idea is that eventually you go through and make that seem less obvious. Mm. Now I can take this whole thing and let's just select all and then define it as a pattern. Now, I don't like to, it just defaults to like pattern six, and to me that's not very descriptive, so I would call it, you know, like pattern seven because that's much better. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> then I would go to like a larger document, and here's where the way I would apply a pattern. You can just use the fill command and choose fill with pattern. The only problem with it is when you do that, it's like, well, besides hey, the fact that I, I picked the wrong that, pattern, <laughs> <laughs> that's magically changed into Corey Barker's elevator picture. So if I pick the brick, it's, it's done and you can kind of see that I hadn't quite finished it off yet, but the, the problem with just using the fill command is the size you get is whatever That's size what it, it is, was yeah. defined mm -hmm. at. Yeah. So instead, what I'll do is I can do it a couple of different ways. In this case, I'll just unlock the background layer and then use the layer style called pattern overlay, which of course defaults to the lovely fill with bubbles pattern. And, and great. so many people use that. Yeah. Yes, I use it twice a day at least. But now the difference is here with my brick wall, I can start to make it a little bit smaller, even a little bit bigger if you want. Again, right now, we're, you can see where the seam is. And one of the tips that I give people when they're trying to make a pattern is actually this. When you're at a point where you think you've got the pattern looking pretty good, go ahead and define it as a pattern, fill it into a new document, and sometimes you'll notice, especially if you zoom out a bit, oh, I didn't notice that half is too dark. Yeah. So then you can go back to the original document where you have the pattern that you're working on and go in and like lighten things Even up. Even a subtle or do thing what, can create like a right, column. Do whatever, or pattern, whatever yeah. you need mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. So sometimes the reality is it takes a couple of those trips to kind of get to the point where you're like, I think that looks pretty good. Then you define it as a pattern, put it into something, size it up and down, and usually your eyes will be drawn to, okay, there's still a problem there. Now the other thing to keep in mind with these background patterns is that sometimes the whole point of a background is to be in the background. So you're gonna cover it up with something else or you're gonna lower the opacity way down so don't stress over things mm -hmm. that are sticking out because ultimately it's gonna be in the background kind of faded out with some photos on top of it so it's not as important. You might not to mention the other little tiny tip is when that layer style panel's open, you can interactively move the right, exactly. around yep. inside of there. You can try all sorts of things with that. Well, and a lot of times because of the depth of field, your background may be out of focus too. Right. You may add a blur mm -hmm. to it so yeah. It, 
creating a seamless pattern is time consuming, even with the offset and right. stuff like that. So apply as much time as you need for the amount of detail you exactly. Need. Yeah, and Some the other get hung up on a lot of superfluous detail. I think the other important thing to remember is that once you define a pattern, it's in there, yeah. so you don't have to worry about I have to do that over again. So it is actually kind of worth spending a little bit of time mm. investing and in making a background that you just or a pattern that you save, and then it's part of your. And like you, I love the I love applying it as a layer style because great you have that kind of mm -hmm. control over. But you can also combine it with other layer styles yeah. and create an overall yeah, interesting background. And you can change it any time. So sure. All right, so let's take a, another quick break, and we're going to come back. We've got things to give away. I've got a few things down here that are just taking too much space. We need to get it out. <laughs> So we're giving it away right after the break. All right, see you then. Well, Corey has delved around in the storage area and yes. found some pretty neat stuff, actually, that we shouldn't give away. We should just keep for ourselves because it's so cool. Indeed, we should, especially this one. I'm going to keep this. The we ultimate are, gift. We giving. are going to give it away because we said we would. So there's actually three different on-one yes. products. We have perfect resize and perfect portrait one and my favorite focal points. Mm. Really cool one. I like this one a lot. So very cool stuff. Very cool. All three for you if you do you accept this mission. <laughs> the mission. And the mission is very simple. Go to kelbytv.com and find the Photoshop user page. There's a comment section. Leave a comment and we will randomly pick a name. And as we always say, it doesn't matter. Well, you don't have to. It's nice if you say something complimentary, but you don't feel you must. But what we do like is when people say, can you show me more information on this? Or I mm -hmm. wish you'd do tutorial on that. Because it's always nice to hear feedback from what people want to see and gives us some ideas we, of We know what we like, do. but we don't know what they like. Right. So, so feel free to uh, make a suggestion. We'll read through those, and you never know. We may do your suggestion on the air, and you could win a prize, we too. Win a prize. How about that? All right. Are we does done? that wrap it up? I think that does. I did. Very good. Well, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next week right here on Photoshop User TV. Bye-bye. Bye, 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 guys.